Daydreaming with Keats, A Philosopher Poet's Tale Part 2 To the north and the south the ways ended in impenetrable mists. To the east there stood a great door, immutable and black, the sun, I felt to be locked behind this barrier. To the west I saw a huge statue, composed of shadow and ice, like a huge cloud passing over a stormy sky, a gloriously sublime vision. I was drawn magnetically towards this thing, and slowly, like a priest approaching the altar, I proceeded to the statue. As I neared to the structure, I noticed that stairs rose from the plinth, which now seemed to be endlessly wide, climbing to fantastic heights. On the top of the base I could just make out a human form, apparently attending to a small fire of, presumably, incense. I ascended the stairs tentatively at first, then more confidently. As I approached more closely the figure I saw it was a priestess, clothed in a white cloak. As soon as I recognized the shape, it turned and stared down at me. I was now some fifty feet from the watcher, and could see a censer swing from its hand. The pendulous object must have had some kind of hypnotic property, for gradually my progress was halted and I felt a deathly coldness rising from my feet, slowly paralyzing my body. Each step took more and more of my quickly fading life force. I thought I might fall at any moment. Then the priestess spoke. Who are you climbing Saturn's seat? The question was clearly rhetorical, for she continued without pause. Let it be known, human, that if you come with a frail heart you will die before you reach this place. Even now your life force is swiftly ebbing. But fear not, for the fulcrum of all things for you has come. Succeed or fail. In her voice there was an eternity echoing, but also a quality which was so deeply sympathetic, its very profundity drove my totally exhausted body up onto the platform where the priestess performed her rite. All this time her gaze pierced me with a melancholy which strove against my will. As I touched the ground where she stood, my body thrilled with a power of renewal, which heightened and enlightened, giving me the urge to talk to, to comfort this sad and incredibly beautiful creature. But no words could I utter, none would pass my lips. For her staring eyes had pierced my heart. At length she lowered her gaze and spoke to me in a voice which was deep and undyingly feminine. You have passed through the penumbral zone of death, and have come laden with the burden of that guilt. I know well how your body now feels the ecstasy of being and is torn by the realization of the ephemerality that carries. Your journey has not been futile, you have discovered that your fate lies not in the world about you, but in the world within. She stood with her arms stretched wide, the incense burner swinging from her hand. I pondered her words, and saw they were not empty but were filled with an almost human intensity. But she was not human. Though her suffering was great, it was incomprehensible to me, for it was not the pain of a woman she bore, but the agony of a whole universe. She had seen truth, it was there in her eyes, the depth and intensity of which had almost destroyed me. O oh, holy lady, priestess of eternity, I see that for yourself the infinite lies within, but it is not so for me. She suddenly raised her head, looking at me in shocked surprise. I continued, I cannot perceive in your eyes deception, and feel that you were once human, but you see all with the jaundiced eye of the infinite. It is so I have felt what you say, but my being is imbued with all humanity, through all ages, and this joy, and this shame I cannot, and will not forego. It is my place to share all the guilt of mankind. Let others see it through my stained, dreaming words. Her face softened. You have spoken well. Mayhap you see with a clear vision my plight, and your logos is beyond dream words. For once I wandered the green earth, and shared your weighty concerns. Amongst the immortals I am now, and as you have not perished you inhabit this boundless stage in you, as I once did, feel, if not understand their never-ending plight. Her head turned towards the fire burning on the altar, her breast heaved, moved by a breathless sigh, and I fancied I saw a tear fall down her cheek. Her mouth opened slowly and again she spoke. Forgive my mood, for it is many years since I spoke with any in this place, and John is not now here and I loved him dear. He lays by the steps of one of our ancient homes, though his words live in the hearts of many, 
and will do as long as your species is. John the Dreamer is now one of the entangled immortals. I spoke to you of our infinite trouble, and you, unlike John, have not echoed my words with knowledge of our kind. Have you any idea of what I speak? She turned to me, a questioning look in her pure, white face. I cannot pretend that I don't know the man you speak of. I have often reflected upon Keats, though, perhaps, without enough reverence. But he is of another time when the glory of the Eternal still rang in men's hearts, not to mention its agony. It is so that I then know of your plight, and I do have some sympathy for you. Laughing cynically, I continued. But you also know as well as I that you brought me here to share in your eternal pain, so must have had knowledge of my desire. She looked at me, searching for more evidence, it seemed. It was not me who summoned you, but the dreaming words of John. I nodded, accepting her words so deeply spoke. I shall then speak of what I know of the dream path that John followed. I pointed at the monolithic figure above us. Saturn sits sleeping here, and we are at his feet, small, but significant. For though your affinity has left you, Moneta, yes, know your name, you can lead me into his immortal land, as you and others have been led. But though I have come this far, and though I know what now drove me, I am undecided. I have lost my reason in this matter, help me. My words trailed off into the dark heights of the columns, like bats in a huge vaulted ceiling. She looked at me, then again turned away. Her hand reached into the fire and stayed there. I started and rushed to pull it from the flames. The next moment we were standing in a glade hand in hand, overlooking a small valley through which a bubbling stream ran. On the other side of the brook in the shade of an ancient oak there sat a huge old man with a long white beard. He sat with his head in his hands, as if in a coma. You know then this man? I didn't look at her or reply. I merely gestured towards an Amazonian figure approaching the deity along the path he had taken long ago. The woman halted by Saturn and fell sobbing at his feet, intoning a lament which silenced all the sounds of nature in the veil. I could at first understand none of the words, but slowly her reverberating voice penetrated my brain, sending an echoing message throughout its gray corridors. O oh Saturn, O oh father of creation, what has become of thee? I will take the burden, I will share the grief. The hour has struck thy heart, struck it a fearful blow, I will succor you, I, Nemeson, will carry the load. Do not sit in shame, do not take the blame, it lies with us all. We are immortal and we have fallen, the timeless hours lie heavy upon us all. O Saturn! The goddess's droning filled all the air with a mist of melancholy, and imposed a monumental sadness on me which extinguished my very essence and gradually I became aware of the infinite measure of the grief that pervaded these lamentable beings. I was about to speak when Saturn's bulk moved, as if a strong dream had pricked him, and from his lips there issued a mournful groan that all but shattered my eardrums. Ah! What has this boundless day brought me to? What creatures of deceit to unseat me? The bonds of my defeat are at my feet, and they bleed as mortals do. His thunderous voice trailed away to a pitiful anticlimax, as gradually his eyes opened to the land of his long slumberous entombment. There at his feet there lay the prostrate form of Nemeson, whom he solemnly spoke to. Why hast thou come to burden my shame with memory? You carry with you only questions that pierce my infinite heart with unfathomable pain, and each sigh you cry serves to strengthen only the profundity of that agony. I see now the region of my rule, when time was mine and my brethren held sway upon the eternal stage. Now because of my appetite strange I am laid waste, and with me all my kind. I shall to my endless slumber return. And his magnificent head fell towards his chest.